yards across America, the lawn is a labor of love. The basis of this national grassroots obsession, turf grass. Turf grass is a dense cover of grass and roots in the top layer of the soil. More than 32 million acres of it are planted in the United States, twice the acreage of cotton. Some 58 million homes sport grass lawns. Grass is typically a permanent fixture, but one unusual lawn was built for travel. The University of Phoenix Stadium is a dome, home to the NFL's Arizona Cardinals. But there's a problem. Beyond hosting football, it's also booked as a site for events that would pulverize a grass surface. They can bring in tractor pulls, big boy toys, I mean, you name it, we've had every kind of show in the world in here. But you can't do it if you have a field in here. The solution is a new twist on indoor-outdoor carpet. But this carpet is made of real grass. As the turf flourishes outside in the Arizona sun, spot watering and computer-controlled irrigation keeps it green. The field is in one piece, not segmented. So to move it inside, the turf can't be rolled in sections. Instead, when game time looms, it rolls into the dome in one hulking mass of grass. The two-acre field sits in a massive tray in layers, much like a birthday cake. A steel support structure and metal decking support the tray. The plastic tray sits one inch above the support structure to allow for water drainage below. The turf grows atop a one-foot thick root zone. This layer is a mixture of sand and reinforcing fibers that provides optimum stability for the athletes. Moving this 19 million pound chunk of sod takes surprisingly little power. An extension cord and a 13 track rail system are all that's needed. A utility trench allows workers to monitor the move from below. There's our warning signal for the field moving. Now we get to listen to that for 70 minutes. Here we're looking at the gearbox to drive the wheel. Here's a one horsepower motor. There are 76 one horsepower motors driving this field at this time. We connect it with two electrical cords. When we come halfway in, we stop, unplug the cords, take them to the other end, we plug them in back down the other end, and then we'll come in the second half of the way. For all you homeowners settled with a lawn that can't move, the real action lies in what you move on top of it. From zero to seven miles per hour in seconds flat. With engines as powerful as 30 horsepower, the riding lawnmower has been the big dog of the yard for decades. In the 1950s, the riding mower was the new status symbol. It was advertised as a little car. Uh, some of them had martini glass holders, uh, all kinds of things. And everybody wanted a riding mower. They were fun. Say hello to the new big dog. It's called ZTR, or Zero Turn Radius. And it's taking a big bite out of the time it takes to mow the lawn. They are more productive, they get the job done faster. From a homeowner standpoint, they're more fun to operate. Part of the fun is trading the steering wheel for a pair of levers. The levers control two independent motor drives that power the rear wheels. The zero turn is getting a lot of attention these days at lawn and garden centers across America. This is a zero turn lawnmower. The basic principle behind it, if you make a right-handed turn, your right-hand transmission is not going to work at all. The left-hand transmission does all the work. If you notice, it turns in place. The right-hand wheel is not moving, but the left-hand wheel is working completely. You 
can go into much tighter places and then get back out without lots of extra maneuvering. Or when you come up to a small tree, you can go around it one time and be done. If a homeowner can go out and do the job in half the time, that's worth a lot. In the centuries before the ZTR and its brethren, turning a pasture into a lawn was a tedious and uneven proposition. As 17th century English gardens gained popularity, the owners began to employ small armies of workers wielding scythes. It was a long stick with a large blade on the end of it that an individual would swing back and forth, uh, and that's how the lawn or grass area would then be cut. Uh, very labor intensive, uh, took a, a good deal of skill to be able to use that over time, especially if you're trying to get a, a low and level cut. In 1830, English inventor Edwin Budding envisioned a better way to get a low and level cut. He built a large cast iron machine with a revolving cutting cylinder at the front. He called it a real lawnmower, and it's a design that lives on today. A real mower shears grass like a pair of scissors. A central shaft rotates a series of cutting blades. The turning blades come into contact with a bed knife. The scissor action cuts the blades of grass. For decades, few people saw the need for a lawnmower. But in the United States, that changed when the urban lawn first came into vogue. Over 38 patents for real type mowers were issued between 1868 and 1873. At the turn of the century, several mower inventions added small steam and even gasoline fueled engines. Many inventors lay claim to the rotary lawnmower. But in 1931, the Louisville Electric Manufacturing Company built and marketed one of the world's first. The rotary design ultimately became the standard by the 1960s. The rotary mower employs a single blade revolving at around 2,800 revolutions per minute to cut the grass and then discharge it through a chute. A mulching mower uses a higher deck without a chute to suspend the grass. A blade with a longer cutting edge repeatedly chops it to pieces and returns it as mulch back into the lawn. It puts the nutrients from the grass blades, the, the decomposition of the grass blades, back into the turf. If you're bagging, you don't have to dispose of the clippings. So there's the landfill issues and, and containment issues of grass clippings. Since 1907, the Toro Company has been one of the leading lawnmower makers in the United States. The Toro Testing and Design Center in Bloomington, Minnesota, designs and builds mower prototypes. The pieces are laser cut and assembled. They're then subjected to a battery of tests that can last for years. The engineers test for safety, performance, and durability. The standard durability drill is called the bump test. Here we try to simulate the entire life of the machine, which uh, may be 3,000 hours, but we try to accelerate the life by having the biggest possible bumps on what we call a roll dyno, which shocks the machine at a very regular basis, and we try to get the end result of the life out of the machine in a reasonable period of time, which might be a month or two months. Mowers are noisy. So Toro engineers are constantly trying to build a quieter machine. The sound test tries to pinpoint noise that can be eliminated. What we're looking for is objectionable uh, sounds or noises that might be coming from the panels that are on the machine, the engine, the fan, the hydraulics. While microphones measure external machine noise, a second test judges the effects on the operator's ears. This is the test where we try to measure what the sound level would be at the operator's ear, and we try to stay within uh, certain measurable limits. Not all yards are flat, so Toro uses a tilt table test to determine machine rollover angles. It has two main purposes, one to check the parking brake of the uh, machines, and second is to check the overall stability. 
we go up to first 16.7 degrees, which is the uh, minimum level for parking brakes, and then we go all the way up to, in this particular case, 25 degrees, which is the upper limit of stability. Sometimes mower operators take their eyes off the row. The drastic stake test is an alarming suburban vision of what could happen. It's to represent the worst we could imagine a customer doing uh, in their lawn if they hit the, the water main or a sprinkler head or other objects in the lawn. A one-inch diameter steel stake is positioned below ground level. The engineers engage the mower blade, move it over the impact zone, and then cringe. And what we're after there is to make sure that there are no failures on the machine to make sure that the machine can still be used uh, for the intended purpose, which is cutting grass. These and dozens of other tests help engineers build safer and better mowers. Recently, Toro began testing an autonomous lawnmower with high-precision global positioning and obstacle recognition capabilities. The prototype represents one possible future option for commercial and municipal grounds and golf courses. But the future is now for the gadget-happy homeowner. Luis Medina founded his company, Evatech, to build a mower for people who would rather do their yard work sitting down. I used to cut my grass with a regular, uh, typical push mower. And I wanted to come out with something easier to use, not just for me, but for my friends. The EvaTech machine puts mowing at your fingertips with wireless joystick control. Well, here we have the transmitter. It has two joysticks that controls a unit. The uh, transmitter sends the signal to the brain. The brain decodes the uh, signal through a very sophisticated algorithm that uh, makes the mower go forward, reverse, and zero turning radius. All that movement is powered by an electric hybrid engine. A separate gasoline engine operates the cutting blade. It even comes with its own seed spreader attachment. Choosing a remote-controlled lawnmower over a self-propelled or ZTR model is a lifestyle choice. But there are other ways to beautify your lawn. You can brush it, slice it, or if you need an upgrade, you can get it cut, rolled, stacked, and delivered. Inside this greenhouse complex in Marysville, Ohio, even a snowstorm can't delay the future of the American lawn. The grass breeders at Scott's miracle Grow Company do more than just figure out how to keep your lawn green. They're conducting experiments aimed at re-engineering the lawn itself. As public water supplies dwindle and fuel prices rise, they're trying to breed grasses that need less water and less mowing. These greenhouse facilities allow us to conduct some of the more controlled and precise experiments that we do with the Scotts Company. We can control light, we can control the soil that we use, we can control the irrigation, the nutrition that we're providing, and really simulate just about any environment that you'd find any place in the world. The greenhouse contains 12 rooms, each designed to simulate different climates while growing a variety of grasses. In one room, they're developing slow-growing, or slow-mow grass, to give lawnmowers a break. These grasses are bred to possess fewer of the hormones that encourage plant cells to elongate. And then they will cross those uh, and go through a, this plant breeding that can take up to 12 years to develop a grass that will then give a desirable lawn without requiring a lot of mowing. Another experiment could put an end to brown lawn syndrome by crossbreeding popular grass varieties with those that can withstand desert conditions. These grasses are in a drought test. They look the same now. They have the same soil. The difference is we are starting to withhold the water. After a period of time, some of them will die. Some of them will uh, just turn brown and maybe green up later when they have water. The key is we're trying to find the ones that are going to last. 
A lawn that requires less water could soon be coming to your neighborhood. But one thing is certain. It will look nothing like your ancestors' lawn. The word lawn dates to 16th century Europe. And the old English word lawn, meaning open space. It simply was an area that uh, livestock grazed and that, that grazing uh, kept the grass short and that short crop grass is uh, really the genesis of lawns. Prior to the 16th century, there were few lawns in Europe. Pastures and public green spaces contained a smorgasbord of grass varieties. The grass types uh, were quite different than what we see here. In fact, some of the grasses, or early lawns rather, uh, were actually things like chamomile or clover uh, and meadow grasses. And these were things that were native to uh, Northern Europe at the time. French landscape architect André Le Nôtre designed one of the first ornamental lawns in 1661 at the gardens of Versailles near Paris. Soon after, British noblemen began planting formal English gardens. But for the English peasant class, the lawn was still an impractical dream. The grass wasn't necessarily greener in the American colonies. Native grasses like broom straw and wild rye didn't have the nutrients to sustain the grazing animals brought from Europe. So very early on in the 1600s, colonists were riding home to Europe asking for clover and grass seed to be sent. Many of the colonist animals starved to death over the winter before the colonists could get grass seed that would sustain them. Even with imported European grass, the low-cut English-style lawn didn't germinate on American soil until after the Civil War. Grass was for the rich. Thomas Jefferson was among them. He grew and nurtured a lawn at Monticello. The average homeowner didn't plant grass in his yard. Grass near the home often attracted snakes and rodents. But more importantly, grass wasn't good eating. Most people lived on farms. And around the farmhouse, you would have beaten dirt. You might have a small garden, vegetable garden, herb garden. But basically, it was a working area. In the late 1800s, however, the lawn took root, at least in the city. Mechanical lawn mowers, fertilizer, and access to city water made growing grass affordable. The lawn also got a boost from the people who depended on lush grass, the United States Golf Association. Thanks to its research, improved strains of Kentucky bluegrass and other varieties hit the market. But it took a suburb to spark a yard revolution. In 1947, Levittown became one of the first suburban tract home developments. Levittown was built in potato fields in Long Island. There were no trees. And the easiest way to cover the dirt and the construction scars was grass. Soon, middle-class America was obsessed with grass lawns. Everyone wanted one. And the Scotts Company was happy to deliver. Founded by Civil War veteran O.M. Scott in 1868, the company learned that the quickest way to a man's heart was through his golf clubs. They were very early mass marketers. They bought or obtained the mailing lists for golf clubs. And they targeted golfers. And they sent out newsletters to tell people how to have a home lawn that looked like a golf course. Today, golf courses and American lawns are cut from the same roll with a sod cutter. Sod is instant lawn. Uh, and for those not patient enough to plant it themselves and wait a few weeks for it to develop, the sod just gives you an automatic lawn. Uh, it's nice and green. And, uh, you know, some people prefer that. A sod farm operates like a nursery. It grows grass specific to the local climate over a period of 18 months. A sod cutter skims the turf a quarter of an inch below the surface, creating carpet-like rolls. The rolls provide a mature lawn in a matter of minutes. But some homeowners prefer their grass homegrown. For that, 
They need pure, straight-from-the-bag grass seed. Seed is grown and harvested like any other crop. Because of its cool, wet climate during winter and spring, and dry summers, Oregon is the leading producer, boasting over 1,500 production farms. The farmers first cut swaths. Swathing severs the plant's moisture supply and helps it to dry quicker. Then they use combines to harvest. The seed is then cleaned and bagged according to very specific formulas. It's a good idea to have multiple varieties involved in a seed mix. We try and mix and match um, a strength and a weakness against each grass so that if something happens in a lawn, like a disease, for example, it doesn't affect all the varieties, there's something there to take over. But some homeowners are not purists. Seeding a yard takes time, and sod can be very costly. For them, imitation is the sincerest form of ground cover. This new lawn in Phoenix, Arizona, is getting a buff and polish. But look closer. The grass is fake. Synthetic grass, or new grass, is a vast improvement on AstroTurf, the fake grass fad that carpeted sports fields and yards in the 1970s and 80s. It was made of polyethylene, an abrasive material with no shock absorption qualities. With the new grass products versus real grass, in addition to your watering, mowing, fertilizing, thatching, new grass, the only maintenance that's required is an occasional leaf blower, plastic rake, or broom just to remove debris. Today's synthetic grass, version 2.0, is made of the less abrasive polypropylene with twisted nylon fibers for shock absorption. Customers can even choose their own imitation variety, rye, fescue, or bluegrass, and have it pre-mowed to the height they desire. Synthetic turf is an alternative to natural grass and a possible answer to shrinking water resources. But if you're worried about your real lawn sucking up too much water, don't call 1-800-FAKE-GRASS quite yet. There is a high-tech alternative. It waters the lawn only when the local weather station gives it permission. Lurking beneath the turf in millions of American yards is a gadget that dispenses the elixir crucial to the survival of a lawn. These days, a lot of people are concerned with drought and how we're using water. We don't want to waste water. It's a very precious resource. In many yards, this resource flows through an underground sprinkler system. The homeowner programs a computerized controller that executes a watering schedule. But there's a new computer brain that thinks for itself. It's a smart controller called ET Manager. And its only master is the weather itself. The computer links wirelessly with a nearby weather monitoring station. The weather station measures temperature, humidity, and other data, and then transmits hourly updates. The controller receives the data, and then tells the sprinkler system when to water and for how long. It actually knows how much water the landscape is using and puts back only the amount of water that the plants need without any overwatering, without runoff, and without waste. Water savings can be tremendous. We found you can save as much as 30, even 40 percent on your water bill. With savings like that, you can bet smart irrigation will eventually become a standard in the American yard. We've come a long way from the garden hose. In the early 1870s, the B.F. Goodrich Company began manufacturing the rubber hose. It made effective watering of the American lawn possible. In 1907, along came the first true sprinkler, the Pluviette. The water drove a turbine. The turbine distributed the water stream while turning on an axis. But better designs lay ahead. In 1935, Businessman Clem LaFetra began marketing a sprinkler that was first developed to irrigate California orange groves. It was called the Horizontal Action Impact Sprinkler. It marked the beginning of the Rainbird Company.
The one I'm holding is a Model 60. It's the first production model that Rainbird actually made and sold. It will go 360 degrees, in other words, a full circle, as it's spraying the water. The impact sprinkler has a spring-loaded spoon arm that repeatedly interrupts the water stream, creating an evenly spread curtain of water. As the arm returns, it strikes the sprinkler head, causing it to rotate. Today's sprinklers go to boot camp at the Rainbird testing facility in Tucson, Arizona. On the demo lawn, both rotary sprinklers and circular pop-up sprinklers that have survived various water torture tests are taking a final exam. That includes the 115E, one of the world's most powerful gear-driven rotor sprinklers. It casts a jet of water as far as 115 feet, providing 360 degrees of coverage. For golf courses or backyard mega lawns, just one of these monsters can water an area equivalent to the size of a football field. In the test center, Rainbird's team of hydro engineers puts the sprinkler's crucial head assemblies through pure hell. We literally just run them and run them and run them until they break. We find out why they break, we fix that and, and continue to run them and make a better product. Sprinklers can also take a beating in your own backyard. An accidental water pressure surge called water hammer can occur in a long section of pipe. The result could be explosive. The burst test simulates the potential yard disaster. So we've set up kind of an extreme test out here that can get hundreds of pounds of pressure, 400 plus pounds of pressure, and we make sure that our sprinkler heads can withstand that kind of pressure. Greenbird sprinklers perform under pressure, but can they deliver water to every blade of grass? This is Rainbird's distribution test. We have over 1,000 catch cans here, and we're measuring the amount of water in each one. They're equally spaced apart, and we're trying to get a very smooth, even distribution pattern. Computers measure the amount of water, and we can adjust the nozzle technology so that we get a perfect, even distribution. Distribution is never an issue with drip irrigation. This water-stingy method is designed for trees, bushes, gardens, flower beds, or any other part of the yard except the grass. It uses what we call spot watering emitters or small area emitters. It literally drips the water on drop by drop, and you run it for much longer periods of time than just at the base of each individual plant. Irrigation and its evolving technologies are the mandatory accessories for a green lawn. But one trip to the lawn and garden aisle reveals a garage-clogging collection of yard gadgets you may not even know that you need. The Tractor Supply Company showcases the latest technology for the do-it-yourself backyard pro. We've got tillers, lawn tractors, chainsaws, trimmers, blowers, every gadget you can possibly imagine to use in your yard and to keep it green all summer long. One versatile gadget is the yard's version of a Swiss Army knife. This is the basic line of weed trimmers everybody's used to seeing, but the newest thing in the yard is the four cycle trimmer. It has a highly efficient motor that keeps the environment clean. It also has a fast attach system where you can put on the regular weed trimmer end, an edger, you can also use a tree pruner, a hedge trimmer, and a blower attachment all with one unit and use one motor in your garage as opposed to having different pieces of equipment. Detested by many, the ear-splitting leaf blower is being converted to a kinder, gentler tool. What we have here is the latest in the backpack blowers. This has 140 mile an hour wind speed, a real low vibration motor, and a smart start spring. It will help it easier to start. A lot less fatigue on you when you don't have all the vibration, but it does hang off your back and easy controls, and you can work with it for hours. The 21st Century Home Store carries an endless catalog of power gadgets to help the do-it-yourselfer keep order in the yard. But when it comes to moving a 40-foot oak tree into your backyard, you're going to need some help. High above this backyard, a crew is preparing to bring down a monster. 
Trees are the pillars that can give a yard scale, but sometimes they must come down. Bringing a tree down is only half the battle. The other half is cutting it down to size. The wood chipper is the Godzilla of yard gadgets. It's designed with rotating drums or discs and sharp knives that can devour a tree and reduce it to sawdust in a matter of minutes. Bringing down a tree is a relatively quick job. But planting a tree and waiting for a shady canopy could take 15 or 20 years. For those who can't wait that long, an outfit like the Davy Company can supersize your order. They're a select fraternity of tree movers. The Davy crew hasn't met a tree they can't handle. When the trunk is 24 inches in diameter or larger, they use a gantry system. They trench beneath the tree and insert pipes to act as a lifting platform. It's a hydraulic process of actually lifting or jacking the tree up. Very similar to what you see in the building movers or the uh, structural movers around the country that move buildings. Once we've got the tree lifted vertically, we have tracks where we can roll it, or we bring in our trailer that we assemble alongside the tree and then roll it beneath the tree. If the tree is less than 12 inches in diameter, a customized trailer-mounted spade is all they need. The hydraulic spade uses a high-pressure pump to drive its blades deep beneath the roots. One scoop, and this tree is ready to roll. The Davy Company put down roots in the U.S. in 1880. By the late 1920s, the company had perfected a moving method. They used what was called an Irish whip, or some people call it an English spar. And it was a device where you actually mounted wheels to the, to the tree itself and tilted it down and towed it to the uh, receiving site and then stood it back up and planted it. In this muddy field on a tree farm west of Houston, Texas, the Davy crew was preparing to move a 40-foot tall, 50,000-pound red oak tree. This is one of six trees destined for a single backyard. Once the crew has excavated the soil around the trunk, trimming the roots is the biggest concern. Our initial process is to come in and root prune the tree. We determined that for this tree to have a successful transplant, we size the root ball at 12 foot diameter. The root ball is a neat package encased in burlap and steel wire. It's the tree's life support system. The crew trims the roots to a safe length based on the size of the tree and then drives in steel pipes. Once we have a significant number of pipes beneath the ball, we'll mount a beam with U-bolts to hold the pipe in a rigid platform. So essentially we have a grid of pipe, which is our steel lifting device. Rainstorms have turned the earth at this tree farm into thick mud. The moisture has increased the overall weight by some 5%. Getting the heavy tree out of the muck is no simple task. The tightly wound root ball and its support platform will prevent damage during transit. A tree hurtling down the freeway is officially a wide load and must travel with a police escort. Upon its arrival in Houston's elegant River Oaks neighborhood, the team begins the arduous process of maneuvering the trailer into the backyard. Now it's time for some heavy lifting. This tree move is called a round ball crane process. It will use a 120-ton crane to try and lift the 50,000-pound tree to its new home. The crane must work in a tight space. Existing tree limbs and power lines complicate the lift. We've left the tarp on on purpose so that as we brush by this existing tree, we don't snag a limb. Now we're gonna pick it up lift it up and over the house and set it down in a receiving spot. 
The connections are checked and rechecked. The last thing anyone wants is a 40-foot oak tree falling into the house. Once the tree is airborne, all eyes are on the root ball. As you notice, the root ball is the integrity of the tree. We treat that like a cake, and therefore, we don't want to crack the icing on the cake. That's why we do all of our lifting from the structural bottom. With the tree dangling a few feet above its new home, it's spun to find the right spot that will cast shade near the house. Well, these limbs are longer. Yeah. Let's let them go out that way. That way to that side. Stop, stop there. The move is complete, but the work is far from over. All of the trees that are transplanted uh, essentially are going into a critical care method at that point in time because we are cutting off a good percentage of the root system. So we're trying to regenerate new roots once the tree is installed. The key to root growth is efficient watering and loose aerated soil. The crew buries perforated drainage pipe on a slope to ensure that gravity will carry water away from the tree and avoid overwatering. A backfill of loose soil compost will help with the drainage. Essentially, it's a two to three year process to regenerate enough of a root system for the tree to survive on its own without the critical care treatments. The Davy Company has moving trees down to a science. But another company aims to transform the plain old backyard into its own ecosystem. One waterfall, one pond, and one fish at a time. We now return to Yard Tech on Modern Marvels. The American backyard has long been the home turf of man's best friend. But today, a new creature is challenging the dog's domain and you don't even have to clean up after him. Koi fish originated in China, and in the 19th century, the Japanese bred them for enhanced color. They are now tenants of a new vision of the American yard, the waterscape. This living, breathing pond is a suburban wilderness adventure designed to bring out the child in all of us. Pacific Outdoor Living in La Crescenta, California, has been taking yards aquatic since 2001. The ecosystem we create with our pond is a community of plants, animals, and microorganisms that we introduce into the area, and they all depend on each other to survive. Before the tranquility comes the heavy lifting. Take this project at a new home in Bel Air, California. So basically, we have about 55 feet of waterfall. It starts up here with a spring, and it's going to come here. We're going to have a nice cascading waterfall. We're going to have 10,000 gallons flowing through here, so it's going to be a really nice, loud, uh, noisy type waterfall. It's going to be very, very beautiful. The waterfall will feed into a two-foot deep koi paradise. First comes a felt underlayment to prevent weeds from invading. Then a rubber liner will form the bottom of the pond. Once this is set in place, we set the rocks all the way around. Starting from the bottom, we rock up and get the different levels rocked in, and then we pour in gravel. Just as the dog gets a doghouse, there's another pond feature that every koi literally can't live without. So this is basically a koi garage. In this area, we have different predators. There's birds and coyotes and raccoons and so forth. So this gives a place for the, the koi to hide. And really, the water only needs to be about two feet deep for the koi to actually be protected. The koi aren't expected to do their own housework. This pond is self-cleaning. So this is the skimmer, which is basically a mechanical filter. So we have the water level is about one inch below this line here and allows the leaves to be drawn into the basket and the leaves are picked up and then you can take out the basket pull the leaves out and, and rinse it out dump it and then we have a filter mat that sits on top of there at the top of the falls a second waterscape filter relies on an unlikely collaborator 
Beneficial bacteria is a very important part of the ecosystem. It's something that we introduced to the pond to help with controlling the algae. It's not gonna stop the algae growth, but it helps starve the algae of its food source. The bacteria are introduced at the top of the waterfall in a biofall filter. The filter contains lava rocks that encourage bacteria to colonize. The bacteria consume enzymes and other nutrients and minimize the overgrowth of algae in the ecosystem. The whole stream actually works as a biological filter as well, too, because you're going to get bacteria that will colonize throughout all the gravel and all the surface space on the stream. The koi do their part by feeding along the pond's bottom, dislodging debris that will end up in the skimmer. The fish are famously tough and can easily survive freezing temperatures by hibernating beneath the ice. This waterscape is complete. Once the landscaping is finished, this yard will certainly draw a crowd. A lot of these areas that we put these water features in is, is a location where maybe they weren't using very much. It was just another patch of grass in their lawn, but now we actually put a, a living, breathing organism in that area. Self-sufficient waterscapes are making some rethink our vision of the traditional yard as a carpet of green turf. That turf requires resources like fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, and in most cases, a great deal of water. What is the future of the American yard? I think that's the struggle as municipalities uh, look to balance uh, the needs of, uh, you know, the homeowner and the desire to have a nice lush lawn, uh, the desire to, to use scarce resources appropriately and manage them well. We have created a savanna from coast to coast. This whole idea of the lawn around the house has become a national aesthetic. It's only maybe 150 years old, but this is what people have been taught to believe. No matter what you cover it with, real grass, fake grass, trees, or water wonderlands, the yard is a refuge and buffer zone. It's our chance to create a particular vision of nature right in our own backyard.